Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Saturday of the month, and I'd like to present to you a brand new show on the Chef AJ Live lineup. And the show is called Ditch the Diets with Dietitian Deepa. Today's topic is Unleashing the Power of Lentils for Weight Loss, and please welcome her to the show. Hello. We did an episode last month and people really loved you and we had an opening and now it's yours. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. I'm super excited to be on your show and about the topic today. The uh, I decided to talk about unleashing the power of lentils for weight loss because I feel that people are looking everywhere for weight loss except the whole natural plant foods that are easily available in, in every grocery store. It's a cheap, yet the most powerful weight loss uh, option that is available out there. And, uh, you know, so I thought that I would unleash this power of, of lentils for weight loss. And what better place to do it for for your viewers on uh, on uh, on your show? So I am excited to be here today. And um, the the agenda is going to be introduction: what what legumes are, what the history is, and why I chose lentils as my as my passion. So we will delve into health benefits of lentils, how to get enough protein the whole protein panic issue I'm going to address and then get into type of lentils. I have, gosh, at least 15 bottles of different kind of lentils here that I'm going to show, followed by some culinary uses of lentils, what to do, what not to do uh, of consuming lentils. And there is going to be call to action. And then I'm going to talk about school meals and the role of lentils in, in uh, children's health. I'm going to end with a very nice calming story about called Diamonds Under Your Feet. So let's get started. Lentils fall under a legume family. So legumes are from a Fabecchia botanical family. And this is the more inclusive classification of of uh, different kind of legumes, which include non-oil seed seeds such as pulses and oil seed crops such as peanuts and soybeans, and um, the legume family includes dry and uh, fresh form. And common types of legumes include dried beans, broad beans, peas, chickpeas, cowpeas, lentils, lupines, peanuts, and soybeans. So. For this presentation, though, I'm going to focus on lentils because that's where I have spent a lot of my time in the kitchen cooking with different kind of lentils as well as beans, but more so in lentil, more so with lentils. And I'm going to tell you why I chose my lentils as, as, a, as a choice of legume. So now legumes have a long history. Okay, specifically when it comes to lentils. And it is truly an ancient crop. And I mean uh, what I'm saying because if you look at the plant uh, domestication by humans, which began around 12,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent, and then it, uh, it, it expanded throughout uh, through the world, including China, Mesoamerican, America, the Andes, and uh, Sub-Saharan African, and Eastern North America, etc. And then it ended up in Indus Valley civilization approximately 5,000 years ago. And Indus Valley civilization has played a very important role in the domestication of grains and legumes. Uh, so there are certain crops such as pigeon pea, black gram, green gram, uh, lab lab gram, and moth bean, horse, horse gram have orig originated in the Indian subcontinent. And interesting thing is I have 
one, two, three, four, five, five of these um, lentils for you to show today. So how super cool is that? And uh, so I'm I later on make sure that you hang in here because I'm going to show you these particular varieties of lentils. Now, just as a side note, domestication of a plant means that uh, domestication or the process of domestication is dynamic and it's an uh, ongoing process of transforming wild uh, species or wild variety of, of plants uh, into a cultivated species by selecting desirable agricultural plant features to meet human needs such as taste, yield, uh, storage, and uh, other, uh, other cultivation practices. So that's what cultivation means. And uh, because of the cultivation or domestication of these plants, the whole uh, agricultural movement was, was, was possible. So that th this is where the whole domestication of uh, legume plants started, like I said, in Fertile Crescent. But when it comes to lentils, it is believed that lentils were domesticated around 11,000 BC in the Near East, in the caves of Greece and in Syria, in a region called the Cradle of Agriculture. And then it reached India uh, 2500 BC. So if you want to just look at the map here, this is where the, uh, the uh, fertile crescent is. Now, in this fertile crescent, in that uh, little agricultural valley, what is believed to be founder's crop were found. So founder's crop is a term that was coined by two uh, academicians, Zohari and Hof, uh, out of Israel. And they identified these eight uh, plants. Three of them are from the cereal group, which is icorn, wheat, emmer wheat, and barley. Four are from the legume group, lentils, peas, bitter wedge, and chickpeas. And the, the last one, the eighth one, is from the fibre or oil group, and those are our flax seeds. So, they were founded very early in a Neolithic agriculture in South, Southwest Asia. And they were the first obviously found domesticated legume, I mean grain and legume and actually oil plants. And hence they are called as founder's crop. Uh, personally, I have not seen the bitter wedge, uh, uh, wedge or wedge depending on whom you are talking to, uh, it's it's pronounced, but I have not seen or touched or uh, or eaten bitter wedge. But I have heard that uh, it it is like pea and also known as health pea. So again, this uh, all these founders crop were founded in this cradle of agriculture, which which lies within this fertile uh, fertile crescent, uh, which is now basically uh, northern Syria, southwestern Turkey. Now, the brief differentiation between lentils and beans, the botanical cl uh, classification is basically lentils belong to the lens genus and beans belong to the uh, uh, faceolus genus. The shapes and sizes, usually lentils are round, they are small, they are lens shaped, that's why they are called as lens, culinary, lens culinaries, which means like a lens, uh, shape of your eye actually. And uh, they come in various colors. Beans are slightly larger, they are round, they come in kidney shape, they come in oval shape, uh, and but they also vary in shapes and sizes. Now, cooking time for lentils is relatively low compared to dried beans where the cooking size 
is a little longer and we will be talking about the cook uh, the cooking methods of lentils a little bit later in the presentation when it comes to texture lentils are softer they retain their firmness depending on how you cook it and uh, they have smoother smoother texture as well whereas beans are firmer and they can be uh, they can take a little longer but they can be creamy when cooked and uh, when it comes to flavor lentils have much milder flavor and they also absorb flavor really well whereas beans have little more more uh, stronger more pronounced uh, flavor and beans can be a little bit sweet but i have noticed over over the years that lentils especially mung type of lentils can have a slightly sweeter flavor now nutritional composition hmm this is where it's going to get very interesting very soon so both lentils and beans are high in protein iron calcium folate uh, fiber however lentils have more prebiotic fiber than than beans and that is a unique property of lentils when we compare the, compare lentils with beans as far as the culinary uses are concerned both of them are used in soups stews salads side dishes chilies spreads etc but i have seen that lentils are particularly more uh, user friendly or can or can uh, imitate the texture of of ground meat or or uh, turkey crumbles or meat crumbles because uh, of the just the way their texture is okay so lentils are a or legumes in general have been extremely valuable crop because of their role not only in human health but also in terms of planet and soil health so legume play a very crucial role or significant role in increasing the the nitrogen production okay and refixing the the nitrogen back in the soil so when legume crops are rotated with non legume crops it improves the fertility of of uh, of the soil by again like i said by fixing that nitrogen and it restores a uh, natural soil matter and limiting the pest related diseases okay so by by having uh, alternate cropping practices or rotation uh, crop, cropping practices such as one year farmer farmer is uh, planting uh, grains like soy or wheat corn and barley oats and the next year they are they are planting legumes that's how the farming should done should be done because legume crops are the only ones who can fix that nitrogen back in the uh, in the soil and why legumes are able to fix that nit nitrogen back in the soil is because they are rich in protein hence they have abundant of nitrogen in them so those of us who, those those people who are worried about their protein on legume containing diet or whole food plant based diet they don't have to worry about it because they are legumes have plenty of protein to not only fix our health but also uh, fixing the health of, of 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 our soil now in addition to that it contributes to the biodiversity for animals and other plants because you know legumes other plants grow uh, uh, alongside of leguminous plant and so on and so forth that's how we maintain the biodiversity and um, they have the lowest carbon footprint in terms of uh, carbon emission as well as they have the lowest uh, water fruit foot footprint it it only takes 43 gallons of water to produce 1 pound of lentils whereas if you look at gosh beef 1857 gallons of water pork 756 gallons of water chicken 
469 uh, gallons of water, peanuts 160, and soybeans 216, and our pulses or, or legumes take minimum at 43 gallons of water. So low carbon and water footprint is another advantage here. Now, so when did my love affair with lentil started? Why I fell in love with lentils is a, is a little uh, side story that I'm going to tell you. So I started practicing as a dietitian in 2006, uh, around, around this month, actually, around May, June. And in 2007 or so, I was invited to speak at a gluten-free uh, conference right here in, in Chicagoland area. And the, the founder of that company, Jen, who later on became my best friend, asked me what I was going to talk about. And remember, 2007, the gluten-free world was all about gluten-free donuts and gluten-free uh, pretzels and cookies and all that. And I'm not a baker. Uh, I, I told her that, you know what? All I know is beans and lentils are naturally gluten-free. So how about I talk about beans and lentils? Because I grew up eating beans and lentils and that was the only uh, basically uh, food groups that we were taught back in school that, that are naturally gluten-free along with obviously some, some grains. Um, so I literally stood there and for an hour showed people different kinds of beans, uh, different kinds of lentils and what to do with them, how to cook with them, and why they are phenomenal, so on and so forth. And the the uh, the uh, response that I got was amazing. I got so many questions about about lentils, and and people wanted to know where to buy them, how to cook with them, uh, how they can start incorporating in their diet. Because my presentation was about. Uh, be gluten free but but not nutrient free because even back then i could see that if this gluten free community just focused on eating donuts and gluten free pretzels and breads and all that that one day they are going to have chronic diseases i could see it back then and i tried to tell but again in front of donut you know i lost obviously so um so uh, i got i got so much uh, uh, i received so much interest in the topic that i started uh, reading more about lentils i started researching more about it and uh, started noticing that there is a there was, there was something in lentils I could see that when I started asking people to start eating, that their gut health would improve. And I knew that um, between beans and lentils, spe specifically the mung lentils or the masoor lentils, which is the pink lentil, are extremely easy to digest. And in most part of the world, that is baby's first food. Uh, so I knew that if they were, if, if, uh, the, the lentils were so gentle on, on babies' GI tract, uh, then the people who are suffering with colitis or IBS, they probably will be able to tolerate. So I would ask people to start eating half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of lentils. But even at those small doses, I could see that uh, their health slowly but surely was improving. And it was around the same time I got an uh, opportunity to, to attend a uh, an event that was hosted by U.S. Dry Lentil and Pea Council. I didn't even know that such organization <laughs> existed until then. And now the, they, they call themselves U.S. Uh, US Pulses, but back then they were called U.S. Dry Lentil and Pea Council. And when I went for that, that, that event, I saw only a handful of people there. It wasn't a big show or anything. And the, they talked about the benefits of lentils and peas and, and legumes. But then I would look, I looked around and saw that in, in real life, nobody was eating it. So I was thinking, the, you know, there was, so the, it was the delta between what they were talking about in terms of how important 
the legumes are for for um, human uh, and soil health, I noticed the underutilization of legumes. And um, the, the, so I started noticing that, you know, people were not aware of eating legumes or lentils. And as I started reading more and more about it, I got more and more excited about it. In fact, I was so excited and there was so much demand from, from people as to how to cook, what to do with lentils, that I ended up opening up a small little uh, company with uh, with different that were and we were producing few different very interesting lentil uh, based products. Actually, it was probably the whole food plant based meal kit type of operation back then. And now you know similar products are in the market. But um, what caught my attention during my research uh, as I went on this adventure with lentils or this love affair with lentils as I, as people started calling me that I was having, uh, that I noticed that the word prebiotic and lentil kept coming. That, hey, lentil as a rich source of prebiotic. Lentil, the uh, uh, utilization of lentil uh, as prebiotic. And that caught my attention because now it made sense as to why my patients were improving uh, in terms of their chronic disease, maybe because of the inclusion of pre natural prebiotic from, from the lentil group. So those of, those of uh, uh, you who want to know what prebiotics are, I, uh, I would like to tell you that not all fibers are created equally. Prebiotics are these special fibers. They are known as low digestible carbohydrates and they're defined as selectively fermented ingredient that allows, allows specific changes both in the composition or the activity in the gastrointestinal microflora that exi exhibits benefits upon host, uh, hosts basically well-being and health. So the prebiotic is a specific uh, colonic nutrient. Prebiotic is considered as a nutrient. It's a metabolic sub substrate and not every fiber gets uh, qualified as, as prebiotic, it's like all, all prebiotic fiber uh, is falls under fiber, but not all fibers are prebiotic. Uh, because in order to get classified or in order for a food to get classified as a prebiotic source, it has to show that it is resisting the digestive process in the upper intestinal tract and it is in, it is fermentable by the intestinal microbiome and it selectively stimulates the growth and activity of health promoting bacteria so these particular fibers are designed are uh, uh, to to promote the the growth of good bacteria in the microbiome and produce what is called as short, uh, short chain fatty acids. Now, these short chain fatty acids are extremely important. And as, I, as I'm mentioning it here, they are produced only when you ingest variety of fiber and specifically prebiotic fiber. Now, everybody knows about the probiotic, obviously, right? So prebi prebiotic is a fiber that feeds the probiotic microbiome. So completely different things. Even though people spend thousands and thousands and thousands of money, the dollars on, on buying probiotic supplements and this and that, if your diet is not robust in prebiotic rich fiber containing foods, the probiotic is pretty much useless. But it, uh, if we focus on prebiotics more, if our diet becomes high in variety of fibers, then you do really don't need to spend money on, on probiotics. So again, it all goes back to making sure that you are eating whole plant food, uh, whole food plant-based diet and uh, 
to maintain your health. So as I was saying, the prebiotic fiber produce short chain fatty acids. The health benefits of short chain um, fatty acids are widely studied and they have anti-inflammatory properties. Short chain fatty, as fatty acids play, play important role in, in um, weight loss. Hence, the, the title of this topic, uh, Unleashing the Power of Lentils for Weight Loss. That is because it uh, because uh, the decrease in appetite, decrease in lipogenesis, which means um, uh, fat storage, it decreases lipid accumulation, which means fat is not, um, is uh, again the accumulation of it and increase in the browning of white adipose tissue. It's the brown adipose tissue which is uh, which causes cardiovascular disease such as heart disease. So all in all, it helps reduce overweight, obesity, and, and conditions associated with those. It is anti-diabetic because, because it improves the short-chain fatty acids, improve the insulin sensitivity, it balances sugar, and it, it uh, decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis, which means, which means it uh, uh, stops liver from producing new molecules of glucose. It is anti-cancerous. It uh, decreases the cancer cell proliferation, increases cancer uh, cell cycle arrest. It decreases, again, inflammation and met metastasis. It, uh, it, it has cardiovascular protection. So decreases blood lipid, thus reduces cholesterol, decreases blood pressure. I'm going to talk about why, uh, which particular nutrient cause decrease in blood pressure that this short chain fatty acid produce because of the prebiotic content of lentils. And uh, it, has, it has neuroprotective effects by again decreasing the inflammatory markers such as uh, COX X2 and uh, intraleukin and TNF tumor necrosis factor. It uh, contributes to uh, uh, constipation treatment by decreasing the transit time through the gut and increasing the intestinal mobility, so on and so forth. So all in all, a fiber rich diet in general will benefit human health. However, addition of prebiotic rich foods to the diet will specifically produce short chain fatty acids, which then have this, um, this um, uh, many health benefits, when, especially when it comes to chronic disease. So as I was studying about this prebiotic uh, microbiome, role of lentils in it, every time of among all the legumes, lentils made the list, okay? And if we look at uh, these prebiotic types, such as sugar alcohol, sorbitol, mannitol, non-starchy polysaccharides, RFO is a type of prebiotic, uh, nicelose, nice APOS, uh, fructooligosaccharide, et cetera, total starch and resistant starch. You will notice that the lentils uh, have pretty much all types of prebiotic fiber, which as of now we know of, compared to other sources of, uh, of prebiotics, such as Jerusalem artichoke, um, onion, garlic should also be here, white bread and and of course the common bean so when you compare lentils with other beans and grains you can see that when it comes to fiber lentils have are a good source of fiber of course they have protein almost uh, one fourth of lentil by, uh, is is protein 26 grams per 100 grams and 42 grams of iron total fat but what, what is most interesting to me was the amount of prebiotic fiber that is found in lentils compared to 
all other grains and beans, 7 to 13 grams of prebiotic fiber, and look at the antioxidant value, which is, which, which is like 7,282, not too bad compared to uh, other grains and lentils. So, uh, like I said, the lentil, uh, the the prebiotic benefit of lentil and overall its nutritional profile kept coming back to me as one of the nutrient dense legume to to focus on so i uh, kept going and uh, reading about the role of lentils in human health and nutrition and started noticing that it wasn't just the prebiotic fiber but the poly polyphenol rich lentils uh, or the other antioxidant component of lentils or, or what is called as uh, 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 flavonoids are also played a role in, in uh, human health. So when you compare 100 grams of lentils and try to analyze it, you notice that it is a nutritional powerhouse. Okay? Every nutrient it ranks very high for energy, protein, uh, well, it, it ranks low on fat, which is which is a great news for us, uh, carbohydrates, dietary fiber, but the look at the mineral profile here, calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and sodium, the, they are so well balanced that you know, they, they must be playing, this particular nutritional composition must be playing a role when it comes to blood blood uh, pressure management uh, of, of one's health. And it also has a lot of folate and other vitamins. So all in all, nutritional uh, the nutritional composition of lentil indicate that they are a nutritional powerhouse. Now, the bioactive functional compounds in, uh, in lentils, that that promote those other health properties like anti-cancer, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory come from these these particular compounds like polyphenols and and trypsin. Believe it or not, even though lectins is uh, is considered as a controversial uh, compound when it comes to lentils, and they, there's uh, you know a lot of con not. not unnecessarily negative uh, 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 rap that lentils or legumes have gotten in gen general has, is, is completely wrong because yes, le lectins when eaten raw have negative effect on human health, but who is eating raw lentils, right? We all soak and cook and eat those lentils. But even then, if there are any traces of lectins, they are a strong um, um, stimulators of of a of some of a particular lymphocyte, which uh, which improve our immune system. So lectins are not bad. Don't get sucked into that 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 kind of uh, wrong information. Along with uh, other, along with lectins are uh, defensins and again dietary fiber. These are the bioactive compounds commonly found in lentils. So the other health benefits of these bioactive compounds include antioxidant activity because of the polyphenols as it is a mm, very strong antioxidant. And uh, there is a detoxification and binding to the carcinogens, which means that the any any environmental toxins that are accumulating in your body, polyphenols are going to bind to it, and and the, they are going to absorb and do the clearance through the bowel, thus reducing the harmful effects of any of the carcinogens that you may be accumulating. The bioactive compounds such as polyphenols or flavonoids also contribute to a DNA repair. So polyphenols have been shown to enhance the, the uh, health of DNA. 
uh, in cells and they maintain the integrity of it, uh, the, the fidelity of it, and thus, thus have their role in cancer prevention. The anti-inflammatory effects come from the, by reducing the chronic infl inflammation in the body, like I was saying, by reducing the TNF and uh, intraleukin uh, cytokinin production. Hmm. Why it's not? This is so interesting, by the way. Oh, you like? Yeah. Okay. I mean, oh, and, I and the thing about lectins that people are even worried about a food that you would never eat uncooked anyway. Correct. I mean, why make a big fuss about something that is not happening, you know? Uh, okay. So, again, the metabolic health benefits continue. Dr. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Chef AJ, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it says metabolic health benefits. Okay, perfect. Because I don't know, somehow the screen froze, so I wasn't sure. Yeah. No. Um, so metabolic health benefits continue with cardiovascular benefits. That, Like I said, the reduction in blood pressure to the through the uh, ACE inhibitor activity. And I think that is because of that mineral profile that I just showed you. Then the weight loss benefits are extremely obvious, not only from the fiber perspective, but again, all the ma macro and the micronutrients that are in there and the uh, uh, appetite suppressant qualities, as well as the satiety promoting properties of some of these nutrients, the blood glucose benefits, the cancer protective benefits. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So, um, Chef AJ, I'm going to take a one minute pause and ask you something. Do you think I made a pretty decent case that lentils are not a new kid on, a, on, on, on the street here, but has an ancient history and is, can, and is like nutritionally wise? Absolutely. It seems like all the healthiest people have eaten them. That is right. So I have spoken to hundreds of people about how beneficial lentils are, how easy they are, uh, they are to get, how cheap they are, all that good stuff, right? But even then, towards the end of the conversation, I sense that these some of my some of some of these people go into that protein panic. Mm. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Do I am I still going to get enough protein if I just focus on lentils as a source of protein in my diet, okay? And they start looking into, oh, if the whole lentils are good, then there must be a lentil powder somewhere, you know, or isolated uh, uh, lentil something bar, right? So I'm going to take a few minutes to, to address this protein panic, I call it that our population is constantly going through, okay? So the first question is obviously how much protein is needed? I want you to take a piece of paper and pen and do a very simple calculation. So if there is somebody out there who, is, who has a standard American lifestyle, which is, you know, one hour of exercise and they need to lose some weight and they are doing daily activities of living, nothing intense. Nobody is climbing the trees here, mountains here, uh, doing farming, all that. And let's say somebody weighs 185 pounds, which is 83 kgs. Now, if we use the standard uh, RDA recommendation, the protein need for general population. Now that already includes people who need more and those who need less. That's how the RDAs are calculated. They have a wide range of, of type of people uh, that falls under that bell curve. So the protein need of general population is 0.8 kgs. 
which means if somebody is 185 pounds, if we convert their weight into kgs, they are 83 kilograms. And if we multiply 83 kilograms with 0.8, the amount of protein that they need is 63 grams. Pretty simple. So for somebody like this, the daily need is 67 grams. Okay, all right. Now, the, then the next question is, so to get my 63 grams, what kind of protein do I need? Do I need to, do I get all essential and non-essential proteins from, from food? And the answer is yes, all plant sources contain protein. The only difference is legumes are lower in methionine and grains are lower in lysine. Now the word here is low, not lack, but low. So if you're eating enough variety, and again, I'm not saying you have to eat 50 different kinds of grains and and uh, and uh, beans and lentils and vegetables. Even if you have a reasonably enough um, variety in your diet, every plant food that you are eating has all kinds of, all um, 20, 21 amino acids. The only difference is the ratio of each amino acid in each is slightly different. And the beauty of this is though, if if you are if if if, if uh, legumes are are low in methionine, they can borrow lysine from somebody else. And that lysine can come from grain, that lysine can a little bit of lysine can come from spinach, it can come from potato, so on and so forth. So all these plant foods, they are like a nice little, uh, it's, a, it's a nice neighborhood where all the neighbors are helping each other to get, the, to get things going. So nobody needs to worry about the whole essential versus non-essential and supplementing with, uh, with, with animal uh, food or protein source to, to uh, get their uh, protein requires fulfilled. Okay, now then the third question is, oh, no, 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 I need more protein because I exercise a lot. I want to build muscles, okay? I said, okay, we'll, I'll help you build muscles. And the example that I'm going to give you is usually given by the nutrition professor at Stanford, uh, 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 Dr. Christopher Gardner. So, so let's say somebody wants to build 10 kgs of muscle per year. Now, 10 kgs of muscle mass is a lot of muscle mass, okay? It's not easy and nobody, <laughs> unless you are a professional athlete, I don't think uh, it's, a, it's a reasonable ask. But let's say somebody wants to build 10 kgs of muscle. Now, let's convert the kgs into grams, which is 10,000 grams of muscle per year. Now, number one, 75% of muscle mass is water so okay so 75 is gone now we are left with 25 percent which is not water so we have 2500 grams of muscle mass per year now let's divide 2500 grams of muscle mass over a year so divide that by 365 days which comes to 6.849 grams of protein per day. So you don't have to eat 20, 30, 40 grams of extra protein per day to build muscle. All you need is 6.6 gram, 6 grams of extra protein per day from any plant-based source, which includes five tablespoons of lentil, lentils, I cooked lentils, or one large potato, or one cup of frozen broccoli, or one cup of brown rice, or four cups of zucchini. You do the math, guys, okay? Protein panic question number four. 
oh, well, this is all good, but what if I want to eat extra protein? I am on a high protein diet. Well, let me tell you something. We have storage for, for our macronutrients. For example, excess fat in the diet gets stored as, as fat. Everybody agrees. Excess carbohydrate gets stored as glycogen. Okay, glycogen is, is extremely important. We need to have that storage to, to do the, uh, to, to give us energy when we are not eating in it, in, uh, anything. So glycogen stores are extremely important. Usually what, two to three grams, of, I mean, two to three kgs of uh, glycogen is stored in human body. So, but that's our limit. Fat, we can store any amount. All the organs, all the cells are capable of storing fat. That's how our body is, is designed. That's how this it functions. So there is no problem storing fat. Carbohydrates get stored as glycogen. But look what happens to excess protein. Excess protein gets stored as fat. It doesn't get stored as a muscle. Nobody is growing extra arm or a bicep or a tricep. It doesn't work that way. So when people don't lose weight and they are on a high protein diet, even if it is high plant protein diet by, by taking uh, protein supplements and, and bars and uh, smoothies, extra smoothies or whatever, well, everything that is out there. I, I have even seen protein water or protein gel. Um, it's all going to get converted into fat. You will be chasing your own tail when it comes to weight loss. It, it, it is not happening. So I hope these two slides will, will put people to, uh, will, will calm them down from this protein panic that they constantly suffer from. So one day, what I did, I just decided to just, I took a random day of what I eat and I put it in my software and see what I'm getting here. So rolled oats, I ate like one and uh, I ate half a cup of dry rolled oats, which comes to approximately two, oh gosh, two, two and a half cups of cooked oats. I, that's my usual breakfast in the morning. And some days I add flax seeds. Uh, that day I added flax seed, which, were, which was one fourth cup of flax seeds. I added one cup of blueberries for snack later on. Then I ate pasta two times early lunch, late, uh, uh, late after, early afternoon lunch. And then I had a salad with four cups of spinach. Then I had uh, two you know, baked potatoes with one cup of cooked lentils and then frozen spinach. Then I was going for a walk. So I ended up eating one sweet potato and orange. So this is kind of sort of a typical day, different foods obviously I eat, but I just picked that particular day to do these calculations. So nothing intense here. And even on this diet here, I got 1,978 calories, 83 grams of protein. And my need is hardly any, 55 probably. I still got excess amount of protein. Without adding any fat, I got 29 grams of fat. I got 68 grams of fiber. That's wonderful. So at least to carry some excess fat out of my diet, if there was any fat get, going to get stored uh, from any uh, intake of extra fat or protein, at least I had fiber, a garbage man, to take that off. And I pretty much met all the needs for most of my nutrients, including the another uh, um, panic pain point for people is the omega. I got 9,715 milligrams of, uh, of, uh, of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And if you look on the left-hand side here, the brown rice gave me 10 grams of protein, frozen zucchini gave six grams, lentils had 32 grams, potato 6.35, steel cut oats 9, 9.75, and sweet potato two. That's where I got my 80 grams. So if this, all these three sides doesn't calm anybody 
down of their protein panic, then I don't know what, what else to do. But uh, I hope it will. So now let's get into some fun things. So there are literally 30, 40 types of variety of lentils. These are just some of the example, green lentils, brown lentils, uh, Spanish, a few lentils, uh, petite, all different kind of black beluga, so on and so forth. And the oldest cultivated variety, the, the pigeon pea, black gram, green gram, moth bean, and horse gram, those are the ones I'm going to show it to you now. So, um, uh, Chef AJ, is it possible for you to uh, focus on me from the from the slides because I'm going to do some show and to, uh, show and tell of lentils. Uh, let's see if I can make you bigger. Cause the thing is, is your slides are taking up quite a, you know, they're taking up most of the screen, you know? So should I go get out of the? Yes, I think it would be better. I can, I, if you would just get out of uh, the slideshow right now, then you'll be very big. Okay. Because I want people to, see this sure you know now the question is i can stop sharing for you here we go yeah can you stop sharing for yeah, me? so now, oh, you're nice, perfect. Now, now you're nice and big okay perfect so let's start with the with the moth beans so remember guys these are the oldest uh, domesticated plants uh, that i mentioned earlier in the presentation so this is how the moth beans come in. They are like little moths, okay? And it's very interesting. So if I get it from a farmer in India, the seed is very tiny and, and it comes from a, a specific village. But if I get it from a regular grocery store in the city, uh, the seed is very big, but nonetheless, Moth beans are still still utilized. So these are the moth beans. These are pigeon peas. Now, the decorticated one is called as turdak, and I'm going to show that to you later on as well. But uh, the pigeon peas with, with, with the husk on, this is how they look. And again, they are one of those ancient ones. Horse gram. Well, there is a reason why it's called horse gram because it is extremely nutrient dense, has a lot of iron in it, and uh, usually eaten sprouted, and uh, again, a, a, a nutritional powerhouse. So we got that. And then I have black gram. So black gram, when it is split, any lentil when it is split is called as dal. And the whole lentil is called as just a whole lentil. So, so this is black gram dal because it's split. If it was whole, then we will call it black gram, not dal. So that's the difference between whole versus dal. And the, the black gram dal has a sticky consistency to it. And it, uh, and it also ferments extremely well of all the dals. So some of the fermented recipes such as idlis and dosas or uttapams where we ferment grains with, with uh, lentils, urad dal or black gram dal uh, is, is a, one of the ingredient. That is that. Now, this is the decorticated ones, which means, oops, not this. Which means the, the skin is removed. What else? Um, then this was an interesting lentil variety that I had seen only in, in US. It, these are called as Sashta lentils and they are zero tannin lentils. And they are beautiful. They have this light pinkish hue and they do not have tannin. So they, they are not brown or green in color, but they have this light tan color. 
And like I mentioned to you, I was so fascinated by different kind of lentils and lentils in general and nutritional property of it. I was involved in a project where we took these lentils and turned it into a lentil flake, which we had infused the lentil with, with turmeric. And you can hear they, are, they, they sound crunchy and they are just beautiful lentil flakes that one could have used in granola or on top of, uh, you know, uh, dairy-free yogurt or oatmeal to add texture. It, it also tasted really good in salads. Then uh, what do I have? So we usually have the chickpeas, which look like these, like chana dal. And the chana dal also the, uh, I mean the chana or the Indian chickpeas are brown in color. But I also have this very unique variety, which is light pink in color. They are called pink chanas. And that is also another unique variety. The, the beauty of this is th that you can go to an ethnic store and get all this. It's not like you have to travel, go around the globe and spend thousands of dollars to to get into this uh, to to get this treasure. This is cheaper than Ozempic, guys. <laughs> if you have time to pick up your prescription, you have time to pick up something from the produce section. That's what I tell people when they say, "Oh, I don't have time to do this. I have time to do that." I say, "Do you go to the doctor?" Yes. Do you go to the go to your pharmacy to get your prescription for statins and diabetic medications and your um, some some band to reduce your knee pain and over the counter for this over the counter for that massage therapy blah 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 yes I do then you have time to cook or and, and get groceries and all this stuff so what else otherwise what other chickpeas are well, I have these another round uh, peas. They are not exactly lentils, but they are these brown peas, which are also an interesting uh, legume to have in the cupboard. Now, the chickpea, uh, the chana dal that I showed you, you also get roasted one that you can eat it as a snack. Similar to roasted chickpeas but slightly different. They are brown in color. So if you go to Indian store, look for roasted chana dal or snacking. Um, okay, we need to go back to the presentation. So that was kind of my show and tell. And we'll take questions later. Okay. okay. So Let's go. Again, people all over the world have been eating lentils. These next two slides talk about different kind of lentils used in different countries, in Germany and Spain and India, uh, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Nepal, it Italy, uh, Peru, Jap Japan, Thailand, Kenya. Uh, Switzerland, Algeria, Israel, Russia, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, uh, Turkey, Sri Lanka, Indonesia. Well, the list goes on and on. And uh, if you look at it, people uh, around the globe have been using it in salads and soups and side dishes. Uh, in India, we also use it in dessert different kind of dessert so uh, that's that because most of these lentils can also be used in in a flower format and maybe later on i will show you a couple different flowers but again different countries have different ways of utilizing lentils as i mentioned earlier a split lentil is called as dal 
and a stew made with lentil is, lentil is called as dal. So that's what this whole dal thing is all about. And there are different ways of making delicious dals. Dal is basically a stew made uh, by using different kind of lentils and herbs and spices and vegetables and other flavoring agents. Now, enjoying lentils. Well, you can sprout them, you can cook them. The, the horse gram and, and the moth beans that I showed you earlier, Almost 99.9% .9 of the time, we sprout them and use them in cooking. Very seldomly we uh, cook it as is. And uh, so these per two particular lentils are usually sprouted and cooked. Chana dal, like I said, comes whole split or roasted and it has a longer uh, cooking time. You get whole chana dal split or flour. It's little difficult to digest. Anybody who has digestive health issues, we don't usually recommend, or I don't usually recommend chana or chickpeas. The uh, the one uh, dal here called wal dal. It it comes from the fava bean family, and it's a little bit bitter. But if you cook it correctly with a little bit of coconut and some some jaggery or anything slightly sweet in there, um, it, it balances out the, uh, the flavor. Then you have the moong dal, which comes in whole yellow or green split format, corticated and decorticated. It's easy to digest. Moong dal is usually baby's first food in Asia and Africa. It is also given to pregnant and breastfeeding moms and those with GI issues. When I started practicing, I was recommending only moong dal decorticated and masur dal decorticated and just soaked overnight with one teaspoon of, uh, I mean, just and just eat one teaspoon at a time. Urad dal, the black one that I showed you, it comes as decorticated as white and split with skin. As I mentioned, it ferments really well with rice and other grains. It's sticky, so you can you can spread it like like similar to crepe on 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 the skillet. Tur dal is the most widely used dal all over uh, Southeast Asia, and it has a longer cooking time. Tur dal is basically the pigeon piece that I showed you, but the decorticated variety. And um, it is usually cooked in a pressure cooker or instant pot. And again, it's, we make stew out of it and it's mixed with greens and root vegetables and different kind of spices. My website has a lot of uh, recipes uh, where I showcase different kind of lentils and, and other things. So when you're cooking lentils, there is a concept called brining uh, the legumes and what it means is it's a process brining is a process where you uh, you add salt to the soap soaking water and what that salt does is the the sodium in salt interacts with the cells of the beans skins and the the skin of the bin bean or the lentil has pectin. Pectin is, pectin is that gel-like substance that we you see when we cook beans. It's, it's slippery, it's jelly-like. That's what pectin is. But um, that pectin is very tightly bound in the skin of the lentil or a pea uh, and a bean. So when you add salt, the sodium kind of penet penetrates through the skin and loosens that pe pectin and allows the water to get in. And, and that helps uh, to make sure that the bean when cooked or the lentil when it is cooked is soft at, and, and has a softer texture. At the same time, it also makes sure that it cooks evenly. So that's the benefit of brining the, uh, the legumes before you cook. And uh, 
And because you are adding salt, you may be worried about the, you know, oh, if it's going to increase your salt intake, but uh, not really because only 55 milligrams of salt gets absorbed for three ounces of lentils that are brined. So it's not like uh, all that, all those three tablespoons of salt is going to get absorbed, absorbed by one pound of lentils. So you don't have to worry about the salt content of these brined lentils. And um, when you're cooking lentils, uh, you can do the quick boil. It cooks in five to 10 minutes. If you're looking for al dente type of texture, then adding it, uh, bringing water to boil, add the lentils, cook for one to two minutes, turn the heat off and cover it for 10 to 15 minutes until you get just, just cooked enough, but not mushy. Now, cooking, cooling and reheating improves the prebiotic content of lentils. Sprouting helps. Instant pot is a, another uh, way to cook pressure cooker, stuffed up me method. And I have also cooked lentils in the oven by just, just cooking, uh, like baking it like um, uh, similar to, uh, to oatmeal. Okay, so you can do all kinds of things, wrap salads, snacks, patties, pilaf, stews, soups, desserts, using lentils. Um, like I said, my my YouTube channel Nutrition is Deepa has some lentil recipes, and I and I keep adding to that collection. So call to action here: Well, visit the ethnic stores and get the lentils. You can start adding one to two teaspoons of hulled or dal, the split lentils, to your diet if you are new to eating beans and lentils to avoid the GI or digestive discomfort like gas and bloating. A lot of people add baking soda, baking powder. Please don't do that because the baking soda, baking powder destroys the B vitamin content of, of, of grains and um, legumes. Uh, you can slightly steam the sprouted lentils to make it easier to digest. But again, don't, don't cook for too long and, and destroy all the nutrients. So can cook lentils with broth, like vegetable broth for flavor. And uh, al dente lentil makes a good crumble substitute. So for um, meat crumbles or turkey crumble substitute, al dente lentils kind of, and you know, then you can chop it um, to, uh, to get that texture and season it and um, you will have a good meatless crumble uh, recipe. Now I'm going to quickly move to a bit of a <clears throat> policy mode here and because I want to address the health of our children and want to talk a bit about the school lunch program. So the USDA's National School Lunch Program serves 4.9 billion lunches annually, okay? 97% of Americans are fiber deficient. And among children and adolescents, it is estimated that 93 to 97% of children are deficient in fiber. When, when a dietary assessment was done on school nutrition, they found that only or less or fewer than 8% of American public schools offered lunches meeting the fiber adequate intake. And no school offered breakfast meeting the fiber requirement. When they looked at the lunches served, only 3% of total food item items contained legumes. Legumes, one fourth cup of legume can be credited as a one meat and meat alternate in school meals. And in spite of that, only 3% of uh, entrees or meal items that are offered on the lunch tray contain legumes. So there is a huge opportunity to, to uh, advance the cause here for legumes in schools because the fiber is the most important 
nutrient for for human survival and for chronic disease prevention. So I'm going to give out a I'm going to give a shout out to uh, two organizations, Balanced and PBNM, Plant Based Nutrition Movement and Balanced is an organization. They are both focusing on on fiber. And in Illinois, there is a law passed that schools are required to provide plant-based lunch options to those students who submit a prior request to get a plant-based lunch. And there are five or seven schools which are going to participate in this, uh, uh, in this pilot. So if there are anybody out there who, who have any role to play in, in school lunch program, please, uh, please promote lentils uh, or legumes in, in schools for kids. Now, before I go, I want to quickly go over the story of, of this story is by Russell uh, Conwell, who was a founder of uh, Temple University, and he wrote a story called Acres of Diamonds. Basically, the, the moral of the story is that there was this Persian man, Ali, who wanted to discover diamond. And he used to stand by the river and, and look up in the sky. Oh, when am I going to find a diamond? Where should I go? He looked, he was looking everywhere. Finally, he packed his bag and went around, around, uh, the, the, around the world in, 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 uh, in search of diamonds, didn't find it, died during the, the, that expedition. And then so when somebody came back to give the message that, hey, Ali has not made it mm, and, and noticed and looked down where Ali used to stand by the river that the, diamond, that the diamonds were flowing in that river. So Ali had the diamonds right next to him. And I feel when it comes to whole food, whole natural foods or whole plant-based foods and those who are not seeing the benefit of it, they are really missing on those diamonds because they're right there. The, the, everyone can find and unleash the power of health. It's, in, it's, in, it's right there, it's in our hands and we are literally holding it. So my urge to you all is to look for Look in your pantry, look around, and and find find tools to to unleash the power of your health. It, it's doable. There's part of part of collaboration. That's why that is where Chef AJ comes in. We she brings all of us together to learn from each other, to share with each other. Um, as a dietitian, I have back to health program uh, where it's it's a personalized nutrition support and. Uh, all different issues and uh, now the, with other uh, local organizations i am starting a support group called satura so if you are interested just send us a text with your name and email or send me an email and i will add you to that support group which is going to meet once a month if you are a healthcare provider and you need a digital module to deliver lifestyle medicine let me know and there is a company who is doing the beta right now and looking for uh, healthcare providers to participate in it. So that being said, that brings me to the end of this show. And uh, I thank you all for watching and uh, Chef AJ take over. Thank you. Okay. So this was a wonderful presentation and I have a couple of, well, I have one question for sure. And I want to say that one of the things I learned that was so interesting is I knew that fat got stored as fat and that carbohydrates got stored as glycogen, but I did not know about protein getting stored as fat. So that was very interesting. Perfect. That that was the point I wanted to yeah. drive home today because of the protein panic. <laughs> Yep. That was wonderful. So Jill wants to know if you do any personalized consulting, she's looking for a nutritionist and specifically would like to consult with someone to help her make a seven day meal plan. Do you do this? 
And if not, do you know someone that does a plant-based dietitian, of course? Of course. Yeah, no, that's, I, I do that. I love developing recipes. I mean, you know, because I was in love with lentils and continue to be in love with lentils, I have developed lots of recipes over the years and meal plan is something I can easily do based on her work-life uh, balance and situation, you know, so what is realistic to her and yeah, so she can text us and we'll get back to her. So, so the information in the show notes is how somebody gets in touch with you. Absolutely. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Deepa. This is wonderful. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. Absolutely. Thank you for calling me again on your show, Chef AJ. You are the best. And uh, see you soon. Great. Thank you, Deepa. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for Dr. Columbus Batiste, and he is going to be talking about stress and autoimmune disease. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.